soon. We are going to give everybody a couple minutes to get on our laptops and trickle in and we'll get started in just a moment. afternoon, everybody. Thank you all for joining us here for our panel, The State of Advertising in New Orleans. My name is Drake Gladder, marketing strategist at Cox Media and programming chair for AAF New Orleans. This panel is brought to you by AAF New Orleans, which provides networking and continuing education opportunities for advertising professionals across the greater New Orleans area. A large thank you goes to Tulane School of Professional Advancement. They generously allowed us to use their panel technology and powered this event. Tulane School of Professional Advancement boasts award-winning advertising, public relations, digital marketing, graphic design, and interactive programs. With us today, we have Dustin Warman, owner and creative director of Communify, Jeff Zender, CEO of Zender Communications, Matt Pruitt, agency director of Mesh NOLA, Cleveland Spears III, president and CEO of the Spears Group, and Michelle Edelman, president and chief strategy officer at Peter Mayer. Next, I will pass the mic to my co-moderator and program director of digital design, public relations, and digital media marketing at Tulane School of Professional Advancement, Amanda Garcia, for a forward to preface our conversation today. Thanks, Drake. Hi, everybody. Thanks again for having us today, and welcome to the State of Advertising. Um, as Drake mentioned, I'm the director of the digital uh, media and design programs here at Tulane SOPA. I just want to give you a little background. About 18 months ago, uh, we made a decision to retool our media degrees to better align with workforce expectations. And then about six months into our research, the pandemic hit. Uh, Tulane in-person learning came to a dramatic halt. The way we thought about creative education was forced to pivot. Uh, students and faculty were met with new challenges we were not fully prepared to tackle, as you can imagine. Uh, collaboration and critiques via Zoom were a little bit like pulling teeth at the beginning. Uh, lectures that, that were once like peppered with intermittent questions and conversations were now met with muted microphones and sometimes cameras that were off. But this didn't mean that our work to make our programs better could stop or should stop. So we did a deep dive into the facts. Where we stood in all of these various industries that we're here to talk about today where we're going, you know, we factored in uncertainty and a dose of ambition. And I'm happy to report that 18 months later, we have newly approved and retooled majors and certificates. But really, what did we learn, right? Like, what did we uncover? So I wanted to give you a quick little peek at what we found when we were doing research for these new programs. So, and I'm focusing on the good news. I'm, I'm the deliverer of good news today. Uh, so the Bureau, Bureau of Labor Statistics predicts a 6.4% growth growth in employment for public relations and media professionals over the next 10 years in the greater New Orleans DMA. So that's 6.4% growth predicted over the next 10 years within the areas of PR, media, and media related fields. Um, additionally, they predict about a 6%, so about the same, a 6% increase in employment in digital media and digital marketing sectors, again, within the greater New Orleans DMA. But where does that leave us if we take the pandemic recovery into account, right? Because of course that all of these numbers were predicted prior to 12 months ago. Uh, so fortunately, if we look at other global markets, um, the US decline in advertising dollar spends were actually not as pronounced as other global markets. Obviously there was a decline, everyone on this call was affected, right? Whether you're in the education sector, private sector, public sector, we were all affected. Uh, but because the U.S. has a, a strong digital marketing presence, it wasn't as bad as it could have been. Um, and on that same note, looking at 2021 forecasts by Publicis and Magna, um, they are seeing an 8% increase in digital ad buys and within the U.S. itself and a 4% increase in traditional media spending is anticipated. So that's the good news. Obviously it's 8% from where we are now, not 8% from where we are 12 months ago, but they are seeing an increase. Um, they also believe the return of consumer mobility, major events, maybe even festivals, uh, and economic recovery will obviously prompt you know, more industry verticals to grow their advertising budgets in 2021. 
And the long-term trajectory that we're seeing um, is shifting even more toward a digital-centric marketing environment, right? I mean, that's, that's to be expected. So aside from statistics and growth projections, we also interviewed many of you on this call about what you saw coming in 2021 and what you expect from your employees and new graduates. And what we learned, what we took away was that you want someone who is nimble, able to roll with the pandemic punches, uh, someone who's agile, smart, and a creative problem solver, someone not afraid to learn new things and to thrive in their job or to take on new responsibilities to help the entire team thrive and the agency survive. And that's why we created not only these bachelor's degrees, but also uh, professional certificates so that students can come into our programs online at night on the weekends and learn new skill sets to meet their new changing job responsibilities or create a new path for themselves. So we did this with your help and guidance and we really appreciate your help. So we are hopeful. Uh, we look at 2021 as an opportunity to prepare students with a new set of skills to meet your expectations um, and the industry's expectations to create a more success uh, successful story for the greater New Orleans market in general. So thanks. We really appreciate your help. And now we're going to go into our panelist questions. Awesome. Thanks, Amanda. Of course. It's no doubt that 2020 changed the way clients spent money on creative and media. New Orleans in particular saw a huge revenue loss in the hospitality, tourism, and restaurant industries. When we think about the state of advertising, what comes to mind? Cleveland, how would you describe the state of advertising in just a few words? Thank you for the question. And thank you to AAF New Orleans for, for having me here today. Excited to uh, share our thoughts with, with you all. Uh, when, when I think of advertising, looking at everything we've seen in, in the last year and, and going forward, I see brands being a lot more uh, intentional about their creative. Uh, I see brands having a lot more focus on the consumer and how to create an emotional connection in response to the times. Uh, as opposed to historically themselves and features and benefits and discounts and things like that. But really, how can we respond to this moment? How can we show that our brand is, is, uh, is aware from uh, what the pandemic related, uh, the, the stresses of the pandemic, uh, uh, racial and social justice issues? Uh, so I, I believe that will continue uh, for some time uh, and going going forward, where brands really trying to make a, an emotional connection, be responsive to the times uh, going forward. Yeah, I think building off of what Cleveland said, I think um, you know our agency has had a um, had a concentration in strategy and insights for quite a while, and so bringing bringing the consumer's voice to the table has always been something that we do first and foremost before we ever put creative um, in front of a project. But I think more in the last year, we saw this happening even earlier, but I think the pandemic really accelerated the need for brands to talk about their sense of purpose. Um, you've taught, I, I think a lot of people have, have been familiarized with purpose-based branding. As consumers, we wanna know how companies operate um, as well as what they offer. And um, having a sense of purpose has definitely led um, brands to do better or, or um, be a little lackluster in, in these times. Um, so we think that that's just going to continue. And um, it's one of the good things as you, you know, you were, you were concentrating on the good news, Amanda. I think that's one of the good things that's come out of the pandemic. But on the other side of the spectrum, even though I think I take your I take your point, Cleveland, that there hasn't been a lot of feature benefit discussions, um, but there has been a lot of need for brands to communicate about just the facts. Are you open? Um, is it safe? Um, those kinds of communication um, messages that really haven't been a part of the consumer conversation in in full were things that we were asked time and time again to concentrate on this this year and to make those things um, approachable and, and sensitive for consumers. It's almost like advertising became a little bit of the PR engine as well as you know trying to compel consumers to buy goods. So it was a definitely a different year. Um, we're coming out of that, but I think there's still going to be room in the communications mix in the next year and a half for those kinds of messages. Michelle, that was like one of the craziest, uh, you know, trying to figure out who was open, you know, what people's hours were. Um, so we've been working a lot with companies, uh, kind of smaller local companies, and everyone is really turning inward, figuring out their re, you know, their own positioning, rewriting, redoing their websites, and being ready to, you know, position themselves for when they can, you know, get back out there.
I was just going to add from a different perspective in terms of the state of advertising in New Orleans, I would look at it as being kind of challenging. I think that this year, particularly, we've always looked at New Orleans as a great place to attract employees because of the culture. Um, you know, people just love being in the city and all that it has to offer. And I think this year was very, very challenging. Um, you know, we've actually had some employees that are now remote in other cities because they just were so upset about the shutdowns in the city. Um, and, and I really hate to see that because I think that's one of our best assets that we have to offer. So I just cannot wait to see us open the doors more often. Absolutely. I mean, those are all amazing points and definitely reflecting inward, you know, that that is that is very interesting. And just to follow up on that, you know, reflecting back on 2020, 2020, should I say, can you identify, can any of you identify maybe a lesson that you learned, right? Like something that you had to do differently, perhaps, um, that will carry you on moving forward, something that you will continue doing beyond um, beyond the pandemic, perhaps. I'm going to punt this over to Matt. Yeah, I kind of, I guess, jumping on to what Jeff was saying is, you know, remote work was something that, you know, we all did, we, we all thought about, but never really thought we would have to embrace it as much as we had. And while a lot of people look at it as a, a big challenge, we kind of looked at it as an opportunity. And even though, you know, our agency has been around for 18 years and gone through multiple transformations, it's one of those things by embracing remote work, we were able to look at okay, can we look at different markets that we could hire people in? Um, uh, Amanda, you talked earlier about just kind of the, the job market in general. You know, we have 50,000 plus people in the advertising industry lose their jobs. And so um, while we are in a kind of a smaller market, um, it really gave us access to new talent, new opportunities, new networks to tap into that we otherwise might not have had the ability to you know, without all of this craziness. Can I add on that, Amanda? Um, you know, I think, and Matt, you know, you guys at, at Mesh have done a really good job of expanding your, you know, depth and breadth with multiple offices and, and new locations. It's funny how the pandemic really reminds me a lot of Katrina, uh, Hurricane Katrina, and how we all had to pivot. Um, and it was funny going in you know, or coming out of Katrina, I felt like we had this wonderful emergency preparedness plan that just got turned completely upside down. And then I thought nothing can possibly upset this apple cart again. And then the pandemic hit, the shutdown. Um, so I think there's just lessons that we learned. We learn every day, right? This, this willingness. So my takeaway was this willingness to adapt to change. Um, you know, a moment ago, our viewers and you all probably saw the top or the bottom of my dog's head popping up on my lap uh, and that's just what we have to roll with now right screaming babies barking dogs drop zoom calls um it, i don't know it adds some interest to it but it's funny that when we were talking before the this started um you were talking about students who turn their cameras off i think in a lot of ways the, the use of video we had this technology we were lucky we have three offices in three markets. So we were already using Slack as a major communications channel, but we weren't even using the video portion, which is just crazy to believe now in hindsight. And I think this has added a dimension where I know our Nashville team talks about feeling closer to our New Orleans team than they ever have, because now we're seeing everybody together on a call. So, you know, there's, that's a positive, I think, out of this. Yeah, I think I think that's you know for operations really stands out. I think that's what everyone's really talking about as the things that you know were were the most profound in terms of adaptation. I mean, we're our agency is very familial. Um, we we are a very tight team. We really love spending time with one another. If you ask people at Peter Mayer what's their favorite thing about their job, they will always say the people, their coworkers. Um, they tend to hang out outside the office together, and all of that really you know, it, it, it had to evolve, you know, we, you know, from, from having big groups of people kind of aligned around a whiteboard all writing to how are we going to translate our tech solutions to meet the culture in the middle a little bit. And so learning how to use collaboration tools that mimicked in-person brainstorming that allowed us to be together um, socially. Um, it's not, it's not perfect, right? It isn't the same, right? But, but 
um, the fact that we've lasted a year doing it this way, and quite frankly, um, have kind of learned the place of video and and remote meetings versus when is it really important to be in person. I think those learnings were were actually pretty fantastic, and I think they're going to stand us in good stead going forward. Particularly when you think about the speed of client business, it's been client business has been speeding up for for a long time. You know, since since digital marketing started to really take off, I think clients have turned around and said, you know, we need to communicate at the speed of the consumer. And so being able to, to, to hop on a quick Zoom call, I think the, the walls, you know, it, it's much more organic. There's not, you know, without walls to be able to do something like that. So I think we've learned, we've learned and been able to operationalize some of the, some things that actually were pretty healthy um, by, by force. And the one thing that was interesting for me as an, as a leader, and I'm sure, I'm sure everybody has gone through this is that in the beginning, it was like, oh my God, you know, like, how are we going to operate? I mean, Jeff, you talked about, you know, kind of creating ways of operating during Katrina. It was sort of like, what's our mode of operating? And getting on calls with other business leaders, it didn't matter whether you were a 20 person company or if you were UPS, nobody had the playbook and we were all trying to figure it out. And so in some regards that was comforting. It's not, it was, it, it's like everyone was going through it, not just the city of New Orleans, but everyone that you talk to in every business sector was really trying to, trying to figure this out. And so it gave us license to, it almost gave us license or fuel to feel like we could make some mistakes. You know, the dogs barking, the babies crying, you know, trying to get technology up and running. That's kind of, it be, kind of became okay, right? Whereas in the past, you know, if you were, if you were from New Orleans and, and your client was as a lot of ours el out elsewhere, they're kind of like, what are you guys doing down there? You know, um, what do you mean you're not open on Tuesday? Well, it's Mardi Gras. You know, you get things like that just does, I think, I feel like there's been much more openness in the business community because we've all gone through this together. Amen. And one point, one point I'll add and, and really uh, in, in alignment and agreement with what the other panelists have said, and particularly Matt, and for folks on, on that's viewing us today that's either entering the, 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 the job for us, you know, coming out of college or, or changing job uh, career opportunities because of the pandemic, the, this uh, mobility of talent now and, and just opening up so many more opportunities for the candidates, for the job seekers, but as well as the, the agencies and, and the companies uh, like, like ours. Uh, during the pandemic, we had a a very tenured, very senior member of our team. Uh, her husband was, was relocated and, and the family was, was moving. And prior to the pandemic, we believed that would have meant that we had to lose that piece of talent. And it happens in a period, we're probably seven months into the pandemic at that point, and she moved to Minnesota. And it, was, it wasn't even discussions like, yeah, you, you now work for Minnesota. And we was able to retain that, that, great, uh, that great member of our team. We've since hired a couple of people in other states as well, because we have all learned the ability of, 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 of kind of uh, working remotely. So it just opens up a host of additional opportunities for folks in, in entering the, um, the, the career market, uh, as well as just making so much more talent available for, uh, for, for agency and marketers. I'll just add one super quick thing. Um, so a year ago right now, my husband and I both had COVID. Like we were one of the first ones out of the gate, crazy. Um, and I, I really relied a lot on my team to help pull us through this, this time. And I think all of us as a team sort of learned a completely new way to work together and how to support each other. And, and then we sort of gave that back to clients by doing, you know, small sessions where we just, we knew everybody was struggling and so we figured out ways to sort of give back and and help you know try to help everybody through that that crazy first few months so Isn't Justin, it interesting? i'm glad you said that too i'm sorry amanda to step on you because you're right I, I remember thinking that in a way i was happy we weren't working in the office because of the fear of you know covid taking down an entire department so and i didn't think about the leadership challenge of that too in your case but um, that's certainly a challenge I think as leaders we've all faced, which was I was happy to not race back in the office and risk being completely down because we were quite busy in 2020. That's great. Yeah, I was just going to say it's interesting that, you know, the things, for example, not using the video function of Slack, you know, or being worried about working remotely, those things that we were afraid of, perhaps, right, or just didn't know that we needed to use have somehow brought us closer together and made us more accessible, which is really interesting. You know, that's great. Yeah. Absolutely. Great comments from everybody. But 
moving forward, we were curious about what media trends you all have noticed and how has the media placement landscape changed through or since the pandemic? Jeff or Michelle, could either of y'all lead us in that? Michelle, you want to go first? I'd be happy to if you want me to. No, go ahead. Um, I mean, obviously, digital and programmatic media is obviously the, the future um, of everything that we're going to be doing. Um, I'm kind of curious. I think also, I would say video, you know, the use of video and storytelling, you know, it's something we all had adapted to from broadcast to video and socials application. But I think it's going to play an even more prevalent role uh, for for us telling those stories earlier. I think Cleveland mentioned that about getting that brand story right. Um, I think video is an exciting way to do it. We all seen the statistics on video consumption online. So I think that's big. The next one I think it's, it's going to be really interesting on trends is going to be, you know, blockchain technology. Um, and I don't profess to be an expert on that in any way, shape or form, but it's a conversation we're having internally right now, um, so much so that we're kind of looking for, you know, who wants to step up and lead this because it's, it's an amazing transformation that's taking place, probably more so even than digital and social media wise. Yeah, I would say I, I definitely um, agree. We've seen even before, even pre pandemic, you know, um, we've established a trade desk and digital and programmatic um, are really, a, you know, a huge growing part of what marketers are interested in, especially as marketers become more versed themselves on on, you know, those technologies, they're less fearful of investing there. Um, we don't we don't have to put together the use cases that we used to in order to even get there, get, get experimentation. Um, but you know, during the pandemic, we saw an unprecedented number of consumers um, starting to stream all sorts of media. Streaming was probably the biggest story um, in media for us last year. And so helping marketers understand the differences between you know, buying traditional uh, television or video forms and buying you know, on streaming platforms I think you know there's there's certainly different types of analytics, different ways to measure success, some some real stumbling blocks in measuring success, and I think we're going to see more of those things that we're going to have to figure out workarounds as you know um, as cookies go away in the next year um, and people became really you know there was a lot of search activity. People are you know if you think about you know just the way people were living last year, they were living from home, and so you know mobile and streaming became. Um, huge. Um, but what's also interesting is that place-based marketing also became uh, really important, particularly in certain sectors where people still need to enter buildings like banks, hospitals. Um, a lot of the client sectors that showed growth last year also realized that they were going to have people walking into their space. And so what did that mean for outdoor advertising that was very micro-targeted around places? Um, you know, we saw people, you know, one of the most valuable things that we ended up being able to offer was communication strategy where it's it's a hybrid between really strategic planning and and media planning where you're really kind of saying all right what are audience behaviors and how do we construct a media plan purposefully around those because behaviors were changing so radically yeah i think the stat is seven hours a day now is how much media people are consuming on an average daily basis and um I love looking at those stats. I, I completely nerd out about it. And I had our media team look at some things, you know, specifically to New Orleans that were interesting, but streaming service is one of those things. So the New Orleans DMA outperforms other DMAs in terms of the amount of people who are on streaming services, listening to podcasts. It's crazy. Um, and, you know, the other thing that's really interesting is, is just the social media aspect of it. Even though people are at home, I think there was a half, half a billion new social media users added, you know, over the course of the year. And, and you, I always look back to, you know, when people, the conversation about Facebook, you know, why should I be on Facebook? Oh, that's just the kids are on Facebook. You know, we're, we're kind of going back through that same cycle with TikTok and Instagram, like, oh, that's just for the kids, but it's, it's really not the explosion of those channels. Um, I think it's really, it's just, it's like the, the purest form of human creativity and expression when you look at a TikTok video and it's, it's all about coming back to reconnecting with people and you know, brands have a huge opportunity to do that because 
yes, you know, people are looking for the best price and the best quality thing, but they also want to believe in the brand and they want to trust the brand to be delivering, you know, when and where they want it. And social media is that perfect avenue to do that. Absolutely. Great. Thank you. Um, okay. So we want to talk a little bit about clients in business, garnering new business. Um, you know, as client needs have shifted over the last year, um, you know, many clients are still engaging, thank goodness, uh, but some could have dropped off. You know, if there are people on this call looking for recommendations on how to garner new business during this time, um, do you have any advice or recommendations in this area? Dustin, I'll start with you. Awesome. I think the thing that worked the best for us this past year has been strategic partnerships. We, we actually work a lot with other agencies, um, you know, that, that do things outside of what, of what we do. We really try to focus very much on uh, branding strategy, uh, web work, um, and, and we do a lot of work in the LGBTQ space too. So outside of that, like we partner a lot with other, you know, agencies who handle media, agencies who handle social. Um, we, we actually worked with Cleveland for many years on the New Orleans uh, tourism campaign. So finding those strategic partnerships has really been the thing that has, has pulled us through um, and, and really like helping us project into next year too. Uh, one thing uh, I'll, I'll add, um, and this is something that we are learning, so I don't want to profess to be an expert on it, but it's something that, that we that been kind of uncovered for me in, in the past year is, you know, uh, most of us on, on the presidential city are in integrated full service agencies and do all these things, uh, but I, we are taking this approach about uh, specialization. How can an agency or a firm or a practitioner even become uh, an expert in in, in a category or in a vertical. So uh, we are, we're working with an outside consultant that's kind of helping us on our strategic growth of our agency. And we are really, and we, we started doing it and we're seeing some, some results from it, but how do you become an expert in, in something? Uh, whether it's a, a, a discipline, a digital, social crisis, whatever, or, or a vertical hospitality, automotive, IT tech. So we think uh, as, as folks continue to uh, look at one, once business and society gets back to normal, when folks are ready to re-engage, the, the ability to, to differentiate your, yourself as, as a specialist in, in something uh, is gonna be a, a, a real uh, competitive advantage going forward. One thought that I'll add on new business is I think we talked a lot about remote work and, and the fact that it works. Um, I think that's also opened up clients' minds to the fact that they don't necessarily have to have an agency that's in their backyard. Um, again, I flash back to Katrina and that probably one of the things that saved us in Katrina was the fact that our, our business was already fairly diverse geographically um, and industry-wise. And we really have always focused on doing that. So I think that helped us in a lot of ways um, through this pandemic, but it's also really opened up some tremendous new doors where we could leverage, as Cleveland said, you know, an expertise in financial services or hospitality tourism or food and beverage, um, but a client in a remote market that might have otherwise said, why do I want to hire somebody from New Orleans, Nashville, um, would say, wow, you've got a great portfolio and, you know, we're, we're going to work this way. And, and hopefully in person in 21. Yeah, I think that one of the things Dustin actually touched on before is really important, which is um, to offer strategic consulting to your clients. Just, you know, extend that, extend that branch out to clients and prospects, make sure that they know that you're there for them that everybody's trying to feel their way through this time, even as we're, as we're coming out of it, people don't even really know what that means. Uh, marketers don't know how to, you know, is it, is it business as usual? Do I have to blend my messaging? I mean, they, people are asking questions that are, that are fairly difficult. And so making sure that as a, you know, in terms of new business, being able to reach out and say, Hey, we have some expertise. We have a lot of clients. We have, we talk about these things every day. If you want to pick our brains, we're here for you. Um, and not expecting that to turn into business overnight, but definitely relationships over time. We've also invested in our own research, um, and, um, have a few waves of, because we have a lot of travel and tourism clients um, and being in New Orleans, of course, that is a huge 
uh, concern of a lot of businesses here when is when our travelers going to return to New Orleans, uh, what kinds of travelers can we expect and when when are different segments of people bound to come back. Um, so we we perform our own studies there as well as watch uh, a multitude of other um, you know, places that are releasing data as well so that we can really, you know, we can really offer some expertise there that's that's very much of the moment as clients feel like they need to pivot real quickly. And then the final thing is last year we, um, we started a, a formal intellectual property effort called Rue, R-U-X. It's on Instagram um, and it is sort of bite-sized daily, you know, bits of inspiration that um, should help people stay on top of culture. What we found was that, you know, the, the former mode of white papers and webinars, although those are really important um, for people, um, what people were really looking for is how do, I, how do I quickly get the zeitgeist of what's going on out there? So we've kind of responded in that way and are trying that mode of intellectual property as a way to um, really, really feed prospects kind of little snacks uh, from Peter Mayer as they go. And so, you know, these aren't, these aren't time tested, um, you know, modes of, of attracting new business. They're, they're more meant for the, for the world in which we live, in which things are still fragmented. People are still asking where things are going. Um, and we just want them to know that we can pivot for them and we'll be there for them. I love all those answers are so good. I was just going to say cold calling, but uh, <laughs> no, no, I, I, I resonate with a lot of, of what you guys are saying. Uh, you know, certainly having the satellite offices in Atlanta and in Austin, Texas and Chattanooga allows us to really kind of mix networks a little bit and find opportunities, but also kind of what Cleveland was saying, you know, it, you're seeing a lot of these bigger brands bringing things in-house, you know, especially on the creative side. And you still, they still have kind of a gap sometimes. And so for agencies in smaller markets, you know, you're able to find some opportunities to be a specialist, to be really good at something and kind of be that missing link for some bigger brands. You, you may not be the AOR, you know, but being a partner, being a consultant, being brought in those things to, to really consult on allows you to kind of work your way in and then build that relationship and, and grow the business within that. And I think that's, that's really something that's changed a lot in the last couple of years. Matt, you realize it's, it's not cold calling, it's cold emailing though now because nobody's <laughs> at their office so you can't no. cold call them, right? No, I know Amanda's going to ask kids coming out of school what they should be doing. Don't email me, call me. <laughs> it makes a big difference. Big difference. Absolutely, awesome. yeah. Thanks, you guys. That was great. And compounding on this new business conversation, we were curious, are there industry trends or verticals you guys see coming up across the next year that may be growing their advertising efforts or some that you may see diminishing as well? I'm, I'll add, I'll start with GDP. I mean, if, I think we, we all probably as business owners, you know, watch the economy and we're wondering what's going to happen. Um, I'm excited by the fact that, you know, GDP projections right now are 6%, 8%. I, I had the good fortune of meeting somebody recently at a dinner that was from Solomon Brothers. And he was so optimistic that he believes 2021 will see 10% GDP growth. Um, that's phenomenal. Uh, I think specific to New Orleans, uh, you know, I'm, I'm more concerned because we have taken such a cautious approach um at reopening that's that's being positive amanda that uh it is you know just really devastated the hospitality industry uh which is the industry in new orleans in a lot of ways so that's sad to see but i am excited by the fact that i think that that's going to be a lot of money i mean we're going to see more stimulus money coming in probably another two three trillion dollars for infrastructure projects um i think the future is, is pretty bright in that regard I, i'm more concerned about the long term, who's going to pay these debts uh, for kids and grandkids. But uh, I do think that there's going to be some some interesting challenges ahead of us, you know, nationally and regionally, maybe a little less so locally. But New Orleans always seems to sort of lag behind the trend, right? Both up and downward, we always have. That, that sometimes is good, but sometimes it is bad. Yeah, I was just going to say, Geonomique puts out a great economic dashboard 
uh, for the region that you can go in and see some interesting trends. And, you know, we've, um, we've experienced a decline in unemployment claims like consistently for the last several weeks. Um, you're seeing Louisiana exports start to be on the rise again. Uh, you're seeing a lot of things bounce back, but, you know, certainly tourism and hospitality and small businesses, you know, are still not as open as, as where they should be. But also, I hate to keep going back to the whole remote thing, but, you know, I think it'll be interesting to see some of these bigger organizations who are allowing more remote work, um, where those skilled workers are going to go. I believe that you mentioned somebody going up to Minnesota or Wisconsin. I don't know why anybody would want to do that, but I would expect somebody, you know, more and more skilled workers moving from Minnesota, Wisconsin down to New Orleans, where we have warmth and culture and music and food. Um, and so I think, you know, we've always been this entrepreneurial community in New Orleans and having an influx of talent and kind of people moving back into the state, even though we've experienced loss of population the last couple of years, um, should provide a lot of really cool opportunities. Okay. And I, I'll, um, I'll add to, to what Jeff uh, uh, said, and, and I believe that there's a, probably a lot of um, uh, folks in, in college or coming out of college uh, viewing us today. The, uh, there should be a lot of optimism about what does this rebound look like? You know, last time there was a, 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 a global pandemic, it, it ushered in the roaring 20s and it was 10 years of prosperity. I've seen the reports projecting 6% uh, GDP growth. Uh, the, the level of, of financial resources being deployed by the, by the federal government um, is, is so massive. It, it can't help but to spur uh, significant economic growth and that will trickle across various industries, sectors, nonprofits, what have you. And obviously that has the, the ripple effect through, through the economy. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm uh, as, a, as an amateur economist, uh, amateur, I mean, very amateur, I, I'm, I'm very optimistic about the, the economic outlook and then obviously what that will mean for our industry as a whole from a, 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 a brand spending power, uh, as well as career and job opportunities for, for folks in the industry. I think it's also, um, Cleveland touched on it at the very beginning, but just the, the fact that brands are really going to jump into this diversity and inclusion at, at their core and not just in what they're putting out for marketing, but really taking a look like deeply at their, you know, I mean, Dixie Beer just changed its name. We've seen, a you know, a, a slew of other companies really look at what, what being truly inclusive means. And I think that is just going to be a, a huge change over the next few years. Dustin, I mean, that's a really good point. And we actually had a question pop in that's very relevant. So I wanted to see if we could touch on it now. Um, the question was, Cleveland mentioned a focus on social justice as one of the impacts of the past year. Uh, John asked, I wonder if he might tell us how, or any of you, how we can help our brands maintain this focus, right? As we're moving forward. So we just don't turn back the clock after the pandemic is over. Uh, I, I'll start off and walk many of my, my fellow panelists to add to it. Uh, I think it starts with the, the client relationship, meaning being a true partner and, and business partner uh, and problem solver with your, with your client, meaning you're guiding them through overall business strategy to, to some extent to where they're, they're coming to you and seeking your counsel and advice on how do we maintain our, our, our commitment to diversity, equity, inclusion internally within our people, as well as our public facing brand. So really at, a, at, a, at your core, having a partnership like a relationship with your clients. And um, last week we had a, a call with, the, uh, with a, a new prospect and a prospect was saying, hey, here's what we need. And they kept using this terminology, spell a transaction, spell a transaction. We just need you to do this, this and this. And I said, well, look, that's not really how we approach our business. We don't really do transactional engagements. We, we, we're here to help and we'd like to help you, but I want to remove that, that word, that terminology from discussion. So being partners, and then if you're in that, that partnership-like relationship with your client, you can help them, you know, one, keep it top of mind uh, and bring that, that equity lens to the discussion uh, when you're, when you're uh, talking to your clients, whether it's about their advertising or their hiring practices or, uh, or certain times of the year, make sure they're acknowledging all of the, the various cultures um, throughout the years, just a host of opportunities to make sure organizations are, are keeping diversity, equity, inclusion, social justice uh, top of mind. Yeah, I think, I think also um, 
it's important for all of us as, as agency and business leaders to ourselves, look at ourselves and make sure that we understand our own biases, um, that we, that we um, are actively looking to build a diverse staff um, and that we build into our insight processes continual information about segments that are growing and, and what's happening in culture um, in terms of the discussion and, and feeling of top of mind of a lot of um, what we've been experiencing, you know, during the pandemic for sure, but even before, you know, I think, um, you know, having George Floyd's murder be, um, happen right in the middle of the pandemic, we were all really floored by it, um, but how many companies really took action. I think um, our, as agencies, we kind of have to be first movers there um, so that when we go to clients and try to partner with them, they see us as, okay, this is a business leader that's already taken these steps. And so we've, we, we have the language, we have the verbiage, we have, we have operationalized it, we've pulled our staff into it, and it's not an overnight solve. Um, but they have to understand that if they don't become the consumers of it, it's going to be hard for them and awkward for them to, to align that with their own constituents in, in communications. Awesome. Thank you all. That was a great conversation. So we did have another question come in talking specifically for more local New Orleans campaigns. What do you guys currently foresee the media mix looking like for those? And do we see, you know, traditional avenues versus digital avenues? I'll jump in if you like. I mean, I, the vast majority of our work is not in New Orleans, but I, I think the I think the media mix is probably comparable in most markets in the sense that this trans continued transition to social digital i mean that's that's where the dollars are being placed uh, and michelle brought up streaming earlier i mean how many of us remember six months 12 months ago when you mentioned hulu to a client they were like who what and and so you know how far have we come in such a short period of time so i think that the continued use of those media vehicles is just going to continue to grow it doesn't mean that mass media doesn't have a time and place it absolutely does just like the billboard example that you gave, Michelle. Um, but I just think digital and programmatic and just targeted media is going to be, um, you know, just continuing to grow in importance, obviously with the caveat of what's the privacy, you know, issues gonna be as those change with iOS updates and others. Yeah, I think you're right. The media mix is is pretty similar to what you would see nationally. And, and I think it's, it's the messaging and, um, the consumption of, you know, like being careful that we understand, you know, how people in the South uh, and in New Orleans um, use their outdoor environment and want to be spoken to as consumers. That to me is the big difference. So, you, you know, we've, we've noticed, you know, in our travel and tourism research that in the South people are much um, more bullish and more relaxed about being in person with one another um, in, you know, it, it, varying everywhere from, with a mask and socially distanced to not. And so understanding where those corridors are that people feel like they want to gather um, with whatever, whatever permission that they're giving themselves, those are places that are, that are probably gonna come into kind of high demand in the New Orleans area as things open up a bit more and as people psychologically open up a little bit more. So um, those places are, you know, have finite media space and so um, coupling them with um, digital and mobile, especially mobile solutions where people are out and about, but they're still on their phones, right? They're still, it's, you're, you're streaming all the time and you're looking at this all the time. So even if you can't secure that, that key place in, in the environment that you wanna be in, you can still rely on the fact that there's an environment that you, can, that you can capture for your consumers and just understanding how to use those online and offline modes together. Yeah, so to sum up the answers, it depends, <laughs> right? That's that's the go-to answer when people ask those kind of questions. But no, I, you know, you, you we do a lot of work in healthcare, and um, you know, it, it's it's also kind of goes back to what what the intentional goal is, right? Healthcare does a, is doing a lot of brand building and is going to continue to spend a lot in brand building activities, whereas you know, on the consumer services side, hard hard digital. 
Um, so that, that just really can take a lot of different ways and um, you kind of have to just kind of break it back to the basins. You know, who are you, who's your audience? What's your goal? <laughs> What's your budget? <laughs> Let's go from there. I'm glad you mentioned the budget piece, Matt, too, because that is so much a part of it, right? Is that yeah. brands are able to do things, even with small budgets, they just have to be really targeted and focused on how they do it. So like probably everyone on this panel and everyone on this call, we all have clients who, are, who, have, who come to us with grand ideas, but very paltry budgets to get the job done. And we've got to be creative enough to say, you know, we can actually do this through promoted social, you know, digital and, and, and get the job done in that big geography you want to target, even with a small budget. And one thing I'll add, and I want to say I agree with everything uh, that the panelists have said, digital is, 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 is where it has been trending for a while and that uh, continues to be the case. But one thing I'll mention is, is experiential. Uh, the ability for brands to kind of create an experience, be it permanent installations, be it an experience that's part of a, a sporting event or, or a festival, where they can actually kind of see, touch, and let, and let consumers feel and, and experience the brand, the great lead generation uh, opportunities, uh, the great ways of, of kind of humanizing a brand, particularly a brand that may be perceived as larger than life or, or sterile or something like that, and they're trying to combat certain uh, per perceptions. Uh, ex experiential continues to be a great uh, uh, addition to the, the media mix that a lot of brands are, are, have, have embraced. And, it, and it's interesting because it's all been on hold. There has not been any experiential in, in over a year and probably another six months or so of that. I think once things reopen and there's this pent up demand, of consumers wanting to be out and about, I think the brands are going to want to help welcome folks back, uh, and I think that's going to be a, a. I think there's going to be some growth in that sector as well. Yeah, that's interesting. I have a, a couple of follow ups coming through here. Um, Ryan asks, in today's environment, what do you feel is the most important and measurable KPI when evaluating your media buys? Anyone have an answer for that? Well, I think it really depends on your objective. I mean, we look at, you know, we look at all sorts of, of things, you know, depending on what clients are really trying to achieve with their budgets, whether they have, you know, um, research oriented goals. So right now um, in some of the sectors that are, are slow to come back, you know, people are being, our clients are being realistic and saying, listen, you know, we want people to, you know, be spending more time on our site or we want people to, um, you know, be, be looking at different pages that, that indicate that they're researching. Other of our clients are like, we need, you know, like in the healthcare sector, it's like schedule an appointment for a COVID shot. You know what I mean? Like it, so it, it, it really spans the gamut in terms of what you're trying to achieve. And I think that um, a lot of what we've seen with our clients is sort of a back to basics kind of a feel where it's like, all right, I really wanna see that through line from that very simple objective to, to what's happening on my site. Um, and um, a lot of a lot of the because a lot of digital advertising we've talked all you know through this about the the prevalence of digital advertising, some of digital advertising is being used for branding at this time, um, and so it is really hard without a tracker and some you know more qualitative questioning than than you get from a click to understand what consumer how how that's really working. Um, but of course, we we always recommend if clients have objectives like that that we work with the. Um, the media providers to see if that's not a value add that they can tack on to um, their their RFP responses, it, it, and we're we're finding more and more of that is is the case that people want to know did the message come through as opposed to did you click through. So um, it's it's interesting times, but I think clarifying that objective is going to give you that answer about your KPIs. There's an interesting uh, question from Luke who asked a uh, little bit on the same topic, but not quite. Uh, we only have about 10 minutes left. So we've got a couple of questions I wanna get to. What have you learned about pandemic relevant messaging as it relates to ad fatigue? And he says, can we please retire unprecedented times? <laughs> so have you experienced ad fatigue with any of your clients and any learned any lessons that we could carry through? Yes to fatigue, right? Um, I think we can all probably relate to the to this whether we're streaming or watching broadcast television. The we scratch our heads and go, why are they playing the same commercial over and over again? Why are they not recognizing, as Matt said, that we're consuming seven hours of of streaming media a day, and we've probably gotten tired of your commercial. Um, 
I think that creates an opportunity for us in a lot of ways to, to really be fresh with new content. And it really highlights the importance of generating new content more often than, than even previously. I totally agree with that. I think, I think people are very tired of it and, and wanting to return back to some sense of normalcy, whatever that is. And so I think it's important for brands to really dig deep and, and just communicate who they are, what they stand for versus trying to uh, keep up with the pandemic messaging, right? Yeah, I think it's our job um, as an industry to find new ways to communicate to consumers that they find memorable, entertaining, informative, um, and to avoid the wallpaper effect. But we also know even pre-pandemic, most advertising really is not that good. So um, I think it's, it, you know, if you have a good agency, they should be able to um, not, yes, unprecedented times, yeah, you know, it sort of goes without saying. I think everybody knows what time they're watching the advertising. Um, and we, it's, it's our job to be creative and compelling to consumers. And, and you, we definitely all need to push back against all that. Absolutely. And then lastly, we have quite a few students on the, the call today and a couple of questions coming in. I'm going to try to put them all into one question here. Um, so as more graduates are entering the workforce during this time, uh, what can new graduates or students in the pipeline, let's say, do to stand out or make themselves stand out who are looking for internships or employment of uh, you know, uh, among graduation, uh, I'm hearing that they need a focus in digital <laughs> or uh, lose experience in the digital space, even if they're on the strategy side or media side or design side, it seems like digital seems important uh, based on our call today and where we're headed. But is there anything that you guys are looking for in particular for students seeking, like I said, internships or employment? We um, just went through a hiring round for a project manager and I found just, just a sort of one piece of advice for students. If I did a call with someone and, and I would go through my set of questioning and if they didn't know what Communify was or had no idea what we did or why they wanted to work with us, that was just like, they were just crossed off. So like be, be prepared and know the agency that you're about, you know, that you're asking about be passionate about what you are wanting to do with them and, and show that in the interview. That note means to call Matt, don't email him, right? Uh, on, the pot, on, on a more serious note, I think that you know, Michelle talked about research and primary research that Peter Mayer is doing. You know, we were on a similar path in terms of five, six, maybe seven years ago, we opened a research and analytics department. Um, I, I think students these days, and, and I know we're all, diversified in terms of the offerings that we bring to the table. So that wasn't a pitch. Um, I think it opens the door though for the students in terms of the fact that they, there are more opportunities now than ever have existed in our industry, um, you know, across all the agencies that are out there. I think that's exciting. I mean, you can have a research background and there's a heck of a career opportunity in front of you. Um, you can have an HR background and from a diversity and inclusion opportunity, there's a huge opportunity. So. I'm excited uh, about it. I think the students do need to be well-educated and Dustin, you hit the nail on the head on that one because so often, you know, Michelle, I get emails that are, that are looking for employees, looking to work for me at Peter Mayer. And I'm like, that's the wrong agency. I wanna send this to, to Mark or Michelle. So do your homework. And yeah, I know you're interviewed, like LinkedIn is your friend. Um, interview like you have three years of job experience, which means you have to have a LinkedIn page. Make sure you're networking with everybody you've ever met. Um, make sure that you're looking at, at your interviewer's LinkedIn page and know something about their background before you talk to them, not just their agency. And we always recommend that people have some semblance of a portfolio site. Even if you're not a creative and you've never done that in your life, you've surely written a paper, you've surely done a presentation that you can that you can put up for consumption. And there's even ways to load that on LinkedIn now if you feel like, oh, I just don't want to put a separate site up. You can, you can load some work samples. That allows us to see how you think. It allows us to see the depth of your work and how you write. And those are really, really important skills for someone coming in at an entry level now. And the other thing I would say is don't give up. Like, don't think that because you missed this round of, of internships that you shouldn't get to know these agencies and you shouldn't start to target them over time. Because especially in New Orleans, we are relatively small. 
people come to New Orleans and they tend to stay here because it's such a great culture. And so they don't leave their jobs. And so, you know, it's going to be maybe a little slower to get in the door at one of these places, but um, just, just keep doing it and keep reaching out. Don't think you've missed the boat just because you missed one hire. Right. And what I'll add um, is one, if you're entering the workforce is uh, something everyone has heard for years now is internships. Uh, internships are immensely valuable uh, when, when you're coming out of college, obviously taking advantage of them while, while you're in college. It, it may sound like a, a broken record, uh, but, but you know, folks like, like, like us, we like to see that type of experience as well as initiative. The second thing I'll say is presence and disposition in your interview. Uh, we are in a, 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 a society and in town where folks are, you know, much, very much connected to their digital devices and things like that. So uh, coming into the marketing and advertising PR industry, it is a fun industry. It's a people driven industry. It's a personality industry coming into the interview with some, some presence and some personality and some excitement. Uh, it will make a world of difference uh, when you're sitting across from, from, from an interviewer. Uh, so that's one thing I'd also, uh, always uh, uh, impart to, to young people into their career. Totally. Go no. ahead, Matt, I'm sorry. Oh, I was just gonna add, you know, show me more than a resume, right? I wanna see a problem you solved. You know, we were all in college. We know that there are hours in between parties that you can take some time and figure something out, right? I, I, friend of mine who started taking pictures of watches and built an Instagram following of thousands of people just by taking pictures of watches, you know? So it's, <laughs> there's little things that you can do while you're in school right now that can, you know, even for internships, internships are in incredibly competitive now. So, um, you know, try to think of something that you can do on your own while you're in school that can make you stand out. Just because it's relevant to the question of, of getting a job, I am curious to know how the other panelists are managing this issue of, you know, seeping culture into new hires, particularly with young people. You know, I know that with more experienced hires that we're doing, you're not as concerned about the remote work. You know, they're kind of coming to the table with experience and practice at doing it, but it's challenging. You know, Cleveland, you make a good point about uh, doing internships, but how many of us are able to really do effective internships right now with so few people in the office? So that's something I think the that maybe this panel has has insight to because we're struggling with trying to figure out how do we take on new hires and really embed the Zender culture into that. I mean, it's forced us to have to articulate our culture instead of relying on the culture to articulate itself. And so when we onboard new employees, there is actually a whole section now about the agency's culture and how it got to be that way and what you can expect of your coworkers. We buddy people up with one another um, to have their first day lunch, even if it's an Uber Eats over Zoom situation. Um, you know, we, we, again, it's sort of that stepping back and thinking about what your culture is and then how do I operationalize it in this climate, even though you know some of it does is not gonna translate, but um, it's made us be more articulate about it. And I guess that's the, the, best, the best thing I can, I can really say. And then encouraging those new hires, whoever they are to speak up when they are on Zooms. Like you're, you may be young, you may be right out of school. We wanna hear from you, we want your ideas. Um, so that they're not intimidated on big Zoom, so that when they're in company-wide meetings, they ask their questions. Um, and the more we can get their voice out of their mouth early on, the better it ends up being for them to connect. That's great advice. Thank you all. Um, before we wrap up, I just want to put a plug in for the American Advertising Federation and other organizations, right? So if there's students, and we have students joining from different schools, plugging in. I mean, I moved to New Orleans four years ago. I was on the board of my ad club back in Texas for 17 years. I plugged in immediately to AAF here in New Orleans, leveraging the AMA, right? Leveraging AAF, AIGA, all of those acronyms. Getting plugged in to your, your local organizations, wherever you are, is going to provide that network for you as a student. And there's many free resources out there for internship posting, job posting, webinars like this that are free for you to come and ask questions and, you know, and be a part of it and identify who Jeff is and Dustin and Matt and Michelle and Cleveland, and then reach out to them after this and say, I loved hearing you talk. I agree with everything you just said. 
you know, are you hiring for interns or whatever, right? So really leveraging those different local resources that you have with these different professional organizations is so important. So we're just gonna wrap up. Drake, do you wanna close this awesome. up here? Yep, thanks Amanda. Really, I just wanna send a big thank you to all of our panelists taking some of your precious time to prepare for this and meet with us today and all of our attendees who have joined us as well. Another thank you to Tulane School of Professional Advancement for making this possible with your technology. And as our panelists and Amanda have discussed, networking is important. Well, AAF New Orleans is here to aid in that. Follow AAF New Orleans on Facebook and sign up for the newsletter on our website for more information on additional events in the future. Thank you all. And we definitely look forward to doing another round table in the future. Yes, absolutely. Thank y'all so much for joining us. Thank so good to meet all of you. Have a great Thanks day. Bye, everybody.